Hello and welcome to the Dickheads podcast. My name is Rob Delves and as always I'm joined by the two gurus in tracks. We've got Sean Jessamin. How are you, Sean? Good, thank you, Rob. How are you, mate? Uh, very good, mate. Good to see you're alive and well down in Pakenham this morning, the Gold Coast of Victoria. Are you? <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it the Gold Coast of Victoria, maybe the uh, the Toowoomba or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, real country flyer, mate. How are those roadworks going, mate? Last time, I went, last time I trekked down there, there was plenty going on. It looks like they're finally improving the joint. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, there's there's plenty of roadworks. They're uh, upgrading the, uh, the Monash, um, removing level crossings all over the place. And so no matter what road you take, you'll get stuck somewhere, which is a pain in the yeah. ass, but... Short-term pain, long-term gain, hopefully. Very, very it's good. Been, as we know, as we, years, hasn't it? Those roadworks. Oh, true. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, yeah. Mate, but, but as Damon knows, the best road in terms of packing them is the road leading out, of course. <laughs> and uh, we cross over to Damon Bednarski. Hello, Damo. How are you, mate? Good, Rob. Good, mate. Mate, what's the update from you? You're just back in Melbourne. You're settled back in there. So, like, what's uh, what's going on for you now? The uh, the Renegades WBBL season has uh, come to a close. Not not too much at the moment, actually. Just enjoying a little bit of time off um, after an intense eight weeks. Um, yeah, a few pre seasons and things are starting back up, but obviously only a few mm. weeks before Christmas. So, yeah, not a lot going on there. So, probably just a bit of a uh, triax content and keep out of trouble before Christmas. Yeah, absolutely right. That's that's what we like to see. And uh, the preseason there, a bit of chat from Damo about the preseason. Um, Shawnee, in terms of your preseason with the Dolphins, mate, how's that going? Yeah, good. Um, just sort of plugging away. We've got about a week left of training uh, before mm. Christmas, and then we'll wrap up for the year. Still like, working hard, but nothing too out of the ordinary. So, yeah, just making a nice, easy transition back and seeing a few faces, which is good. And um, otherwise, yeah, nothing too out of the ordinary for us. No, very good. And so will you be giving your players any sort of like programs or plans to go over the uh, over the Christmas break or like how, how will you do that? Yeah, we usually have like a little generic program um, that, we, that we give to everyone to do. Um, they'll have um, a gym program and then like an at-home program, which will be more um, body weight stuff um, for them to do. And then the gym program. Um, as well, just to get them through the, uh, I think the three weeks that we'll be off. Um, and then once we're back after then, that's when we'll start to um, do some testing and some screening and that sort of thing. And we can give everyone a more uh, specific individualized program. Very good. And just ramp it up as well. Yeah, that's it. Start to, start to crank it up. Uh, and so me and Damo obviously repping the hoodie. Are you repping the hoodie as well, Sean? Yeah, my uh, my yeah, camera absolutely. angle, you can't quite see it, but yeah, uh, we've all is. got it on. Yeah, absolutely. And so we've seen a few people uh, put their gear up on the various social media outlets, which is uh, which is great to see. And yes, a few people have even shown us the uh, the unboxing from the mail <laughs> of the t-shirt. So really, uh, really appreciate that. We're getting some good feedback, and it looks pretty good. I reckon the green and the black. So um, I think you've done all right there, Sean. Yeah, thanks, mate. I'd, I'd love to take credit for it, but I, I didn't actually put anything together. I just took took some orders and uh, took some names and made sure we got my money. So mm. we're good, mate. Mm. Merch by name, merch by nature, eh, Damo? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> no, well, on that note, anyway, appreciate uh, everybody sort of contributing, helping us out on that front, buying some merch, uh, tagging, um, taking us in on their various social media outlets. So we thank you for that. Thank you for supporting the Triax brand. So um, we really appreciate uh, everything so far in terms of feedback, support, likes on all the um, social media forums that we're on. So thank you for watching on YouTube or listening on podcasts and, and Apple iTunes as well. So thanks. Thank you for on that front as well for your continued support. Um, and if you have any queries, questions, or anything going forward, please don't hesitate to get in contact with us. Um, really happy to help out in any way we can, particularly with preseason coming up with programs and, and anything along those lines. So we are keen to um, lend a hand if you need it. So um, on that note, keep tagging us in your merch stories and we'll get stuck in the podcast. So our last few podcast boys, we've spoken about um, aerobic training and about basically trying to incorporate your own training principles and build your own training program. That's what we've spoken about. Now we want to move into tracking our progress along the way 
um, particularly with monitoring training load and even seeing how we're going in terms of our progressions physically. And so a popular way to do this is via the old, if you're on YouTube screencast, you may have the old Garmin watch or a smartwatch, something along those lines. So this podcast will focus on basically um, technology that we use to help us monitor our training in terms of IE, basically smartwatches. And we'll go through all the different um, things you need to know surrounding these watches. Now, boys, maybe if we can give us a little intro into smartwatches and why people use them and all the different um, variations and tools that they uh, they provide us. Yeah, so unless you want to um, spend all your time with a, with a trundle wheel and some cones um, and a pen and paper wondering how far you've run and that sort of thing, then then by all means go for it. But a smartwatch is going to pretty much automate that for you and do it all yourself. So the, the most common sort of measure that a smartwatch will give you that most people will use is the, the distance that you've moved. And so it can break it down into, you know, different, um, different speeds that you've run at and how that training may have affected you. So whether you've been training aerobically or anaerobically, um, that sort of thing. It gives you heart rate. The accuracy of all these is a little bit debatable and we'll get into that uh, shortly. But the main thing is going to be um, that people use is essentially just distance and how, how far you've been able to run. So now, uh, Damo, if you want to maybe just chat, us, chat to us about how um, maybe the evolution of these products, so how they sort of started and then what activities and, and stuff we can track from them. Yeah, I guess so. probably one of the first ones you would have seen on the market is probably sort of the Fitbit, um, mm. which is almost looks like a pedometer that had, you know, the yeah. time on it and would give you a step count. Um, obviously, technology's progressed quite a bit now. And so it's moved from just giving you that general step count or distance. Um, and now the devices sort of have accelerometers and GPS um, tracking inside them and um, heart rate sensors and all this sort of stuff. So it's gone from giving you pretty basic metrics of sort of steps and distance. And um, I guess the way they were doing that originally was that it would just be based on your um, stride length times how many steps you've taken. And that's how they'd calculate distance. Um, when you're moving into the more advanced and modern technology, it's generally using a GPS to track where you've moved from. So the accuracy of how far you've actually moved is pretty good. Um, compared to just sort of, I guess, estimating off uh, estimated stride length and how many steps you've had. Um, mm. And then sort of they've also added in, so you've got the heart rate um, monitor. So most watches that you'll see now, um, if you don't know, like the little green lights that are on your watch, that's actually what is used to measure your heart rate. So um, what how that works is the green light um blood absorbs green light um so there's some little diodes that pick up on how much green lights absorbed by your blood and then um obviously the higher your heart rate the more blood flow there is so the more light that's going to be absorbed so if you've ever wondered why the green lights are there on your watch that's what that's for and essentially that will give you again it's probably more of an estimate than an accurate reading of your heart rate um, but that can give you some information on that um, and what we'll talk about a bit later in the podcast as well is about how these metrics are then used to um, estimate other metrics that you probably see mm. on your smartwatch that we've got. So things like um, energy expenditure, VO2 max, um, aerobic or, or anaerobic training. Um, that all sort of comes back to those two key features, which is the distance and your heart rate. Um, mm. Yeah. So. So they've come um, a long way, haven't they, Damon? Yeah. Because like, yeah. these things basically started off as pedometers used to wear on your hip, wasn't it? Back in the day, you used to get out of the Kellogg's box. Yeah. The old pedometer. And it yeah. basically eventuated from there, didn't it? Pretty much, yeah. So they've just adapted that and, you know, with technology being able to put it into a watch. So not only does your watch tell you the time, you can um, get these other features. And then also with mm. the smartwatches, you can get other things like messages, phone calls, all that sort of thing, which is not really related to what we're worried about. No, absolutely not. So what you might see with a lot of AFL pre-seasons rolling around now is that players will actually wear their smartwatches when they're doing time trials as well. So you'll see at the start of time trials, they'll turn their watch on um, to help them sort of gauge where they're going. But what other activities 
would be suitable to like for you to buy this watch and like for you to actually get anything out of it? What sort of activities would somebody um, be doing to get the be- the most benefit out of these watches? I think um, so. Any sort of aerobic um, activity. So it's probably not suited for. It's not going to tell you much if you've gone and played a game of basketball, for example. It'll tell you how far you run, but it's not going to yeah. be able to break too much down for you. But um, they actually, if you I don't know what, depending on the watch you have, but um, I have a Garmin watch and it can give you, it gives you all these different activities that you can, you can track from um, different sorts like running or like hikes and that sort of thing through to like cycling, rowing, swimming. Um, I haven't used it for any of those besides running and, um, and like gym sessions, but yeah, it, 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 breaks it all down so you can um, sort of track what sort of sessions you're doing and what sort of activities you're doing. Um, and so, yeah, those longer distance sort of more aerobic based uh, activities are what it's going to be best suited for. So we're talking in terms of like gym, cycling, swimming, triathlons, marathons, like all that sort of stuff, aren't we? The real sort of basically the three sort of main pillars of exercise and running, cycling and yeah, uh, swimming. That's probably yeah. and that's what these that's what these things are designed at. Really, aren't they? They're the sort of three core activities that you're going to get the most bang for your buck out of wearing these devices, essentially. Because that's and a lot, of, especially the Garmin's and stuff. That's a lot of it is who it's marketed at is those athletes, uh, the endurance athletes, and all that sort of stuff. Because as we'll get as we'll touch on shortly about how the duration of these events um, helps the accuracy of these devices tell you what you want to track as well, particularly for your VHM maxes. Um, and some of your training effect scores around that. So maybe if we can touch on now what our standard smartwatch will provide us, and then we'll go through each sort of um, each variable, and then have a bit of a discussion around it. So Damo, if you want to kick us off, mate. Yeah. So um, obviously they tell the time. Um, that's what most watches oh, do. So that's oh, that's pretty oh, handy. Um, oh, lost uh, in yeah. Uh, step count. Um, so then that leads into sort of distance covered as well. So you'll get that from the step count, heart rate, as we touched on earlier. Um, then you're sort of moving into ones that are a little bit more of estimates. So you've got energy expenditure, um, which... So, so do maybe, do you want to define that, Damo? Do you want to define like the energy expenditure and all that? Yeah, so I, I have a Garmin watch as well, and that's generally calories burned so that's what that will be um working with so it's calories at rest or when exercising so that's the estimate um that they'll be using there and that's the value that you'll get um some others that they'll give you so garmin as well gives you sleep quality if you wear it while you're sleeping um and a measure of stress and then you're sort of moving into some other um, variables that you can get as well so when you actually train it will tell you perhaps like how much rest you need to have after that training mm. session based on your um, current training load. It'll give you an estimate on that as well. So to sort of tell you if you're maintaining productive or um, if you're peaking in your training based on the volume of training and the intensities. So again, that's all based off the heart rate measures and the distances that you've been covering. Um, stress is another metric that they have on um, the Garmin, which I mm. that's one that I'm not, too sure how they actually measure that i think that's to do with heart rate as well um mm. through the day so again it's coming back um to that variable and then again from these other ones you'll get things such as um what type of training it may have been so if it's aerobic or anaerobic or if there's any benefit at all so if you haven't really pushed yourself it's probably going to say that there was no aerobic or anaerobic benefit from the training that you did um and then also the one that's probably quite popular and spoken about a lot is the the vo2 max um predictor that they have on garmin as well which will give you mm. an estimate of what your vo2 max is absolutely and the vo so the vo2 max that's like the equivalent of you telling someone how much you bench or squat isn't it for a runner or a mar- ultra distance athlete that's your bench press score isn't it yeah i've got a, I've got a 60 vo2 max whatever that's the money shot really that's what everybody want to, wants to work towards isn't that it? or that or how quick you can run a kilometer or something like that. You know, your two two yeah, k yeah. times probably up there as well. It's a bit it's yeah, to you, Rob. It's a bit like your uh, yeah your ATAR score, isn't it? You go around <laughs> telling everyone that. I can't remember what it is, Sean. To be honest, that's such a long time ago, mate. I have absolutely no idea what it was. 
Um, but obviously wouldn't get out of bed for anything less than a 90. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's move on. So now we've discussed the different metrics available to us in terms of smart watches and all the different variables we can look at to track our progress. It's probably time to talk about how accurate they are because a lot of people, they see these numbers that we get and take them as gospel, but they are susceptible to some um, discrepancies in terms of the validity and reliability in our data. So, boys, this is a pretty important topic we should talk about considering how much this technology will cost the average punter. So maybe if we want to talk through a few of the different variables and just talk about how accurate and valid they actually might be. So, Shawnee, do you want to kick us off there, mate? Yeah, so I suppose the most basic one that's going to give you will be your step count. And generally, this is pretty accurate. It can pick up on some non-walking movements just because your watch is attached to your wrist. So um, whether you might be in the kitchen cooking something or um, driving over a bumpy road, sometimes you can pick up on um, some things that it thinks is walking, but it's not actually. So it might boost your steps a little bit. Um, but for the most part, it's going to be pretty accurate if you're just, just walking. The distance covered, um, again, I, I don't know about you boys, but I find with my Garmin watch, I find this to be mostly pretty accurate. Like it'll have a little mm. bit of um, a little bit of error here and there because I think more watches now, they actually use a GPS um, built into the watch rather than the old stride length multiplied by the step count, which is what they used to do. So it's a little bit more accurate. With most GPS though, the faster you're running or the if you're changing directions and not running in a straight line, that's when it can become a little bit less accurate. But generally speaking, if you're just going for a jog um, around the block um, or doing some laps at your local footy oval, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty accurate. It's going to give you a decent enough gauge of how much you run. It might be off by a hundred meters or so either way. Um, but for the most part, it's pretty accurate. Uh, yeah. So in terms of distance there, Sean, it's a good point. Um, what you can look at to see how, I guess, accurate or, um, indicative you like the distance was of what you actually ran you can check the trace of it as well so you have um if you're synced to strava um what will happen is after you sync your activity you'll see basically the heat map or the location the location which you've run so if you've if that map is pretty similar to what you've actually run yep. then you can have a little bit more confidence in that's the actual distance you've run personally what i've seen a couple of times my watch is that it might um, it'll be pretty close to what I've run, but there might be a few uh, variations in the data points that suggest I might have taken a shortcut when I probably haven't. But so that's some of the methods you can sort of see um, whether your distance uh, as measured by the GPS was pretty accurate. Yeah, I think the best thing you can do um, is if you can run at an oval um, because it is mm. an open space, so there's no interference as well. So I've noticed if you run around the streets and there's tree coverage and you sort of cut and maybe not on a main road or something like that, the GPS actually um, struggles to pick up on that. And um, if you go under a bridge or a tunnel or something like that, that cuts out. And sometimes the watch yeah. actually completely cuts out. So if you're especially if you're doing an interval session or you're trying to get a really accurate measurement, the probably best place to do it is at an open space. And if that's an mm. oval, um, yeah, that's where you get the best readings. Or just go to Packham, mate. Because there's that, there's that many open spaces down there in the green pastures of Packham. There'll be no interference at all, except maybe if you run into a few roadworks. Mm. Um, it'll measure heart rate as well, which um, it can vary a little bit. It's not the best... Um, best measure of heart rate. If you want to make sure you're getting your real accurate heart rate, you need to buy a heart rate strap that you mm. put um, under your chest. You wrap it around, wrap it around your body. Like for me, for me on my watch, um, the heart rate seems to be okay. But Rob, I know you've said that your watch seems a bit, a bit off yeah. with, with the heart rate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so on our TikTok. And on our Instagram reels as well, I did put up a little bit of a, um, a video in preparation for this and talking about the accuracy of the Garmin watch. And so I basically did two identical interval sessions. So I did five one kilometer intervals 
in each session. And so the first one, I think my average heart rate was about 163. And then for the second session, I reckon I was about five seconds slower on average, but the average of my heart rate in terms of beats per minute was like 140, I think it was. So it was about a 23 beats per minute difference on average, which is just ridiculous considering I wasn't that much style between the two sessions. So for me, and for me, I know I've seen variation in it as well. Like I know I'm, I'm blowing, I'm huffing and puffing, and it's telling me that yeah, my <laughs> my heart rate's only in the aerobic training zone about 140 beats per minute. And I know that's just not accurate because I think you know as well, like if you're huffing and puffing, yeah. And you're mm. really feeling the effects of it. You're not at 140. You're probably closer to like 75 plus in terms of your, your percentage max. So that's some of the variation that I've seen with it. And I think that um, lends some support to what you said about wearing a chest strap, because I think that the most um, effective way of measuring the heart rate is wearing some sort of chest apparatus. It's got to measure it because that's closer to the source. And it just, again, takes out um, an extra bit of, um, well, the extra issues in terms of the validity that we see. So I think it's a worthwhile investment if you're mm. a fairly can runner, Sean. Yeah, there's a few other issues too, I guess, like um, there's other physiological things that may affect your heart rate. So even if you're doing the same session, you know, there just mm. may be other things going on that might vary it. But like you said, Rob, yeah. 23 beats yeah. per minute is, is a big difference for an identical mm. session. Um, yeah. I guess the, the few other things as well as so... Um, especially the smart watches, the, they can be impeded. So um, skin tone and tattoos and other things like that actually can impede the light going in. So if you do have that, you might notice that you might actually have a difference in, in heart rate. So there's been a bit of research out there that's looked at those things. Um, so yeah, if, if that's something that, you know, you think might be an issue and if you're really keen on it, um, definitely mm-hmm. the chest strap because the chest straps, been proven to be the closest um, yeah. thing that you can do that's similar to an ECG, which you'd get at the hospital, which gives you the most accurate heart rate um, reading. So rather than using a light, there's actually um, electrodes in yeah. the chest strap that actually can pick up on the heart rate. So it's not just estimating on blood flow. It's actually picking up on the heart rate across the chest. And as Rob said, it's closer to the source. So it's going to be more accurate. Yeah, absolutely. And I think and that's a that's a real good point that we should emphasize that if you if you're fairly coming out of your training and you use a lot of heart rate intensity based training methods in, in itself, then you should probably invest in, in the heart rate monitor because it just saves you a headache as well. Because what we'll talk about soon is that heart rate measurement is pretty important for some of these other metrics that a lot of people like to use and go by as well. So I think that's um, a worthwhile investment if um, that's suitable for you. In particular <laughs> so maybe if uh, uh maybe now we spoke about heart rate a lot heart rate is obviously the basis for a lot of these metrics um so maybe damo if we go into a bit more of the um the more fancier and sexier sort of metrics that we get from these watches in terms of maybe like the stress sleep quality and then like recovery times and the granddaddy the vo2 max so maybe if we start with in terms of our sleep quality and energy expenditure in terms of the accuracy around them yeah. Um, so the, the sleep quality measure, um, again, this is, again, based on heart rate and um, movement and restlessness during sleep. So um, for that, uh, the heart rate's actually quite accurate when you're at resting levels mm. and if the exercise or whatever you're doing is at a consistent pace, it's, it's mm. less accurate when there's variability. So um, for a sweet sleep quality um, perspective, if you're wearing it in the correct place, um, it will actually pick up on the heart rate and actually give you not a bad reading on that because obviously Mm. sleeps, um, you know, you're not moving during it generally. Um, And then the little movements that you do pick up on will just alter that sleep quality um, perspective. So that's probably actually one of their, the smartwatches better capabilities where there is actually some, pretty good accuracy Mm. there Um, but it will depend on you know some people actually uh move quite a bit during their sleep but it doesn't actually affect um their deep sleep whereas other people are pretty you know stagnant in that so that will give you slightly different readings um depending on how yeah how have you found it boys have you looked at that and thought oh that seems about right or might be a bit out or not um, I used to wear it to sleep, um, yeah. a while ago and I, yeah, I, I think it was quite accurate in terms of 
that was the in terms of telling you how long you've slept for and giving yeah. you a good like yeah. of the deep sleep and stuff like that. I think the measurements there were pretty accurate to what was happening, but um, I've stopped wearing wearing it during sleep for a fair while mm. now, so I don't really have yeah. a more current um, yeah. discussion on that. Yeah, I don't I don't really use it. Oh, I don't really wear it to bed either. I did a couple of times and it was it was it was like there it was thereabouts. It was probably a little yeah a little bit off um in some things whether it be the deep sleep or the the time that it thought i was asleep for where i was actually awake um and that sort of thing but again it's i think with most of these measures they're going to give you a good enough guide but without being mm. too yeah 100 accurate yeah i think i think if you're having sleep issues or something like that you should be yeah looking to see a doctor and get a more um, accurate measure of how to actually look at that rather than relying on your, your fitness watch for that. It'll yeah. be a good gauge. Like if you're looking at it for a recovery perspective and you want to know how long you've slept for and all that sort of thing to maybe map out those types of things. Um, it's probably not the worst thing to do, but if you're obviously trying to take it quite seriously or if it's related to a health issue or a mm. sleep issue, then certainly don't rely on the smartwatch, go and get, um, tested and some proper information on that but again yeah it's a it is a good gauge to know roughly what's happening absolutely and then so maybe energy expenditure as well yeah so energy expenditure this is another one that's um it's it's based on a lot of metrics so um the age that you input on your garmin or your apple watch is going to be um used when estimating this your height your weight um your gender and then it goes on any bodily movements after that and your heart rate. So obviously all of those factors. So if your um, height and weight aren't accurate, then the measurement that you're going to get isn't going to be as accurate as it possibly could be. Um, and then again, so the, the age and the gender based variables that they've got in there, these are generic um, things. So like Garmin and Apple watch and Fitbits and uh, polar and all these different watches have their own little algorithms for that. So each one's going to be slightly mm. different and it may not be specific um, to each individual. So again, it's more of a gauge. Um, and again, if you're using this for a health based reason, so, you know, you need to do this many burn this many calories to um, meet a, a health goal on a daily basis, then it's probably not the best thing to be doing. There's other ways to measure that um, that could be more accurate. So the one thing with the energy expenditure as well is that um, the, the research that has been done on it um, has sort of shown that as the intensity increases, the accuracy of the energy expenditure decreases. So mm. um, it's pretty good for resting um, calorie burning and low intensity. But as soon as you get to moderate, and vigorous intensity physical activity, it sort of um, goes out the window. So um, as I said, if you're trying to rely on um, that because you actually need your energy expenditure, if you're trying to implement um, a weight loss program or if it's based on your health that you need to, you know, burn a certain amount of calories, it's probably not the most accurate thing to do. It'll give you a guide, but it certainly won't give you um, 100% accuracy on that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so now if we want to go into the, maybe the more training based uh, or the direct training based metrics that we have available to us. So in particular, Garmin's pretty big on aerobic and anaerobic training effects, which I believe is derived from uh, first beat sports. Uh, I think Garmin bought out first beat. So they use a lot of their technology, but what will happen essentially after the end of each training session, particularly in outdoor sort of running um, from what I've my found is that the, the watch will give you a training effect score out of five for aerobic and anaerobic uh, contribution there. So five is overtraining, three, I basically think it's two and up is improving um, for each different um, each different aerobic and anaerobic training effects. So maybe if we can talk a little bit about um, those those measures there. Yeah. So again, this, this is all derived from your, your heart mm. rate. So as Rob was saying, when, if you look at your Garmin or an activity after you've done it, it'll give you um, your heart rate range throughout the mm. activity and it'll have it in a nice little graph. So essentially there's a nice little white line that's across there that if you go above that, it's um, your heart rate's above 
working above your, I guess you would say like aerobic level. So you're going into anaerobic territory once you're above that. So that's when your heart rate's 75 or eight above 75 or 80%, Rob, I believe. Um, yeah, which yeah is, it depends yeah, you, how good you are, yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah. So um, what you'll notice is that if it's an aer- a, a session where it gives you this little output that, you know, aerobic based training, you know, two, and then it gives you a 1.2 for your mm. anaerobic is that um, quite a bit of your work on that graph will be above the white line on the graph. And so you'd be working above that 75 to 80%, depending on what, what you're using. Um, so if you're above that um it, it's again going to work on your accuracy of your heart rate monitor mm. so if your heart rate monitor is out by 20 that actually has serious impacts on mm. telling you how much aerobic or anaerobic work you've done because it, once you're getting close to that you know it might actually be only a, a five beat difference will be the difference between you being at aerobic or an anaerobic level so again yeah it's all, it's all coming back to that accuracy of your heart rate measure so um mm. i think That's, what yeah. If you, if you really want to be working and know how accurate your training is, then that heart rate chest strap is probably going to help you because if you get an accurate measure, you can then, again, prescribe training based on heart rate, which can you can dictate whether it's going to be an aerobic-based or an anaerobic-based session. Yeah, I think, I think that's a common theme here, isn't it, Sean? I think as well, yeah, like a strap. lot of this, like the training effects stuff, um, particularly like, I know just from my experience, I've gone out and done um, a, a running session that's more anaerobic in nature, more short distance, high intensity stuff. Um, and at the end, it'll tell me that I've done more aerobic work. The watch will tell me I've done more aerobic work than anaerobic, which I think that mm. if the watch doesn't actually know, because they're just basing it off heart rate, they, they, it doesn't always necessarily know what exactly you're doing in the session either. Um, so I think that plays into it as well. I think the uh, I think from what I've read as well, it, it uses heart rate as so, sort of like a proxy indication of epoch, which is uh, equals it excess post exercise oxygen consumption, um, yeah. which I think has a factor in like the range of the anaerobic and aerobic scores as well. So if you if you're huffing and blowing it, huffing and puffing a bit in terms of your epoch, then that might also have an influence on your training effect score. And which I like, and Damo said before, when I did my two sessions that were exactly the same, the first one, the heart rate looked pretty good and that had like a pretty even anaerobic and aerobic training effect, which was based on the training that I did. Now high twos and then I did the same one again and it was like a 2.9 aerobic and then a 1.3 anaerobic. So again, that heart rate does sort of have a, um, a big influence on, on the accuracy of those scores yeah i think touching on what sean said sorry about what you're actually doing so say for example you've gone down and you're doing a 120 percent mas interval run um obviously during the exercise your heart rate is going to be quite high but then you have these rest periods and so as we were saying before the, the heart rate's actually quite inaccurate when there's changing intensity of exercise so yeah. um, if you're consistently going from okay so the 120 you're running at three minute kilometers and then you're standing there and having static rest the watch is just the heart rate essentially is flipping out because it can't comprehend what's going on there's this really high intensity exercise and then there's nothing and then at the end of your say set of eight reps you then have two or three minutes static rest again the watch is sort of not able to comprehend what's going on and so if the heart rate variables and so what you'll notice in those sessions even though like you said that's probably more of a um an anaerobic base session where you're really trying to you know, work hard at a high heart rate, but the watch is thinking, Oh, well actually majority of the session during the rest periods and that actually were lower. So I think one way to get around that is the smart watches. You can actually input sessions. So you can put in like interval sessions. So when you have those rest periods between sets, it actually removes that from there. So it, it it can give you a bit more of an accurate reading. Mm. Um, so I guess it just depends how you use the watch as well, but those static rest periods between each rep are still going to affect the heart rate and will change the overall, um, I guess, training effect of the session you have. Absolutely. So now probably go the last one we'll probably touch on here will be Virtu max. Cause that's a big one. Everybody wants to check that out. Um, that's the moneymaker. So 
obviously there's a big emphasis from these companies on VO2 max and they like to give you a nice a prediction or a projection of what it actually is. And to be honest, the only effective way to um, obtain your VO2 max is in the lab uh, doing a test there, but that's pretty pricey. And if you're a bit of a, a weekend warrior or an intermediate athlete, it's probably not necessary, but if you're an elite operator, it might be something you'd look at, but essentially VO2 max is based on a few different things for the watch. We've got a few different variables. So you'll have, variables that you input in terms of your age, height, and weight. But then the watch will take over. And when, so when you do some sessions, uh, your heart rate, speed, and the distance or your session that you're running. So those are the sort of main ones. Um, but again, as we know, and we talked about, if your heart rate itself is a little bit iffy, then your VO2 max will be iffy as well because a lot of that is based on there, which, again, I found out. So before we open up the discussion of the boys – what Garmin will tell you, um, we'll use them as an example because they're probably the most prominent in this industry, is that they only have about a 5 to 10% error on their predictions with VO2 max, which is pretty good um, if, you know, if what they say is true. Um, obviously, it beats going into a lab and getting tested. But again, the error will fluctuate and be worse with errors in your heart rate as well. So that's something you have to take in um, before you actually you know, take these values as gospel, I guess, boys. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if as as we've said consistently throughout, so if if the heart rate's not quite right, um, that five or ten percent is obviously going to blow out a little bit because mm. then there's an error on that on that end of things. Um, I think one other thing that we haven't really touched on as well is the the speed. So the speed of, that you're running is actually used to calculate. I, I've noticed yeah. on the watch that this that's probably one thing that is a little bit out of whack as well. Sometimes it's you know, you look, you seem like you're flying, but if you've actually measured out the distance and all that, and you go, actually that, that pace that you're running at may not be entirely accurate. So that's one of the variables again, and that's going to come down to whether your watch has the GPS inbuilt or whether it's relying on um, you to have a phone with you that uses the GPS there. So if you're having that one, then um, the pace that you're running at actually will be different as well so i guess again if you want to be the most accurate you need to have the best device that has the inbuilt gps or um you know if you've got access to it actually wear like a gps unit so a catapult or an spt or something like that because i've done that i've worn an spt device and run with my watch and the disparity between the two was quite high we're talking like five or six hundred meters difference between two Mm. devices which is pretty inaccurate if you're trying to you know run a session Mm. and distance is a pretty easy measure for a gps device to measure as well like it's not as if it's a high deceleration or acceleration distance is a metric that you probably want to get right um but then the other thing as well is when people these companies tell you that they only have a five or ten percent error that's effectively like me going to a Toyota dealership and asking the salesperson what the best car is or what the best car brand is as well. They'll only tell you the good things and they'll only tell you to you. So just take a lot of this stuff with a grain of salt too. Yeah. And that's not to say that they're not valuable. It's just um, d- depending on what you actually want to use mm. um, your mm. smartwatch for. Well, that might work in nicely then to our final segment on this podcast is how do we decide what smartwatch we should buy or use as well. So there's a lot of different things we can cover here first, boys, but what do we think are the main um, prerequisites or the main things we should think about before we buy some of these, um, for some of this technology? Um, I suppose first work out what you actually want to use it for. Um, so uh, as we sort of mentioned that they're probably best to um, measure any sort of aerobic activity. So whether you, do a lot of running or swimming or cycling. Um, they're probably going to be your best bets because um, they can give yep. you a pretty good, pretty good measure of um, a few different uh, metrics. The main one being distance, mm. obviously. And then it, it all sort of depends on how into it you are and how serious you are about your training. Um, if you're, as Rob sort of said before, if you're just a bit of a weekend warrior, um, then it's going to give you an okay measurement. And, but if you're a bit more serious then um, you might want to either opt for one of the more expensive smartwatches, or you might need to opt for additional technology uh, on mm. top of that as well. Yeah. Um, but the main one's going to be that if you just want to keep a basic 
sort of guide um, or a basic tracker to see what you've been doing in your training and so you can keep track and make sure you're improving, um, then a smartwatch is going to be able to do that for you pretty easily. Yeah, and that, that's the thing. There's varying price ranges and, um, you know, different watches that are better suited to different activities. So even if you go onto the Garmin website, you know, there's ones that are specialised for people that do triathlons because mm. it's got a better swim and cycle function and the running's pretty good. Um, there's other ones that, you know, people that are into hiking or outdoor sort of stuff that, you know, this one's designed to be more accurate in those circumstances. Mm. Um, obviously, when you drop down the models or you're looking at sort of um, divide like the Apple watch and stuff, their, their capabilities are more that it's a generic product that can give you as many features as possible. And the accuracy, um, obviously it's, it's not purpose built just for exercise. So the top end Garmin ones are purpose built to be for specific activities. Whereas mm. if you got the Apple watch, um, which is great, they've done a fair bit of research and a lot of their metrics are really good and quite accurate for what they're doing. And that's probably more suited to the person that's the weekend warrior, perhaps that also wants to get um, the additional perks of being able to, you know, receive calls, messages, um, do all those functions. So again, as we've said, if that's, if you're just looking for a good gauge and it gives you some information and roughly what you've been doing so that you can track it and progress, then, you know, that might be the device for you. So a mid range Garmin or an Apple watch or um, a Fitbit or something like that. So yeah, as we've said, it's really determined by what you want and the level of um, information and accuracy you want. Absolutely. And I think the uh, demo just raised a good point there as well about if you're a triathlete or if you're doing a bit of water-based stuff as well, then that's a consideration that you should take into buying your technology and particularly heart rate straps as well. Cause I think what you will tend to find is with Garmin, they'll have like a triathlete run strap as well, or as you can buy a run sort of heart rate strap. So take those um, points into consideration as well. So, but if you're like a team sport athlete, like a, a footy player, a rugby player, a soccer player, whatever it might be, then you probably want something that's just a good general running watch because that's what you'll use it for. And then you probably would maybe want to have a little bit of heart rate strap as well. Like you're probably not going to wear them in training, but if you're doing your own training, recess and training, it might be of some value to you depending on how seriously uh, you take your training. But- I think if you're going to be using heart rate based exercise prescription as well that's yeah. the another big reason to get a heart heart rate strap mm, absolutely right absolutely right sean it's a great point all right boys well, we might wrap it up there i think that was a um, pretty informative podcast uh, if i don't say so myself so good job um but if you'd like some uh, help advice or some feedback on your own conditioning stuff for team sports or if you're an individual athlete please get in touch with us for a variety of different packages that catered to help you out so please get in contact with us uh, there if you're as i said if you're an individual athlete or you're if you're a team as well particularly because it's coming to that time in the year for pre-season but nonetheless uh, thanks very much for all your support and feedback thus far so thank you for having a look at on youtube or uh, apple Podcasts and spotify as well and thank you for supporting the instagram reels and the tiktok as well that's really <laughs> thriving from strength to strength so we appreciate that uh, yeah, so Sean, if people want to get in contact with us, mate, uh, on social media, how do they do that? Uh, if you search for Triax Performance on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, the uh, talk. you'll find us there. Uh, Rob's blowing up the reels on Instagram, so he's pretty happy with himself lately. Going viral, very good. And then Damo, the old-fashioned way, mate, how do, how do people get in contact with us? Yeah, we've got the email is admin at triaxperformance.com and then the website is um, triaxperformance.com. Very good. Thanks for, the, uh, for everyone for buying the merch as well. So keep tagging us in the merch. Uh, we'd love to see it on the, uh, on the store as well. But thanks to, uh, to you, Damo and Sean. No worries, Thank Rob. you, Rob. Good thanks, job Rob. today, mate. All right, thanks very much, boys. And uh, we'll see you next week, hey, on the DKEDS podcast. Bye for now.